Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Um, I want to give a quick announcement. This Wednesday will be the Spirit of Friendship Award, so I encourage everyone to come to chapel on um, Wednesday. That's always a really exciting chapel. Um, so today is the last of our senior testimonies. I'm really excited to um, introduce them for you guys. Today we get to hear from um, Brad Asraf, who is, um, there you go. <laughs> Um, you'll get a chance to welcome him in a, him in a minute. Um, he is an English major. I had the uh, privilege of working with him last year on staff um, as RAs in Founders, and it was really a privilege to get to know him. I'm really excited for what he has to share with us today. Um, the second person that we're going to be hearing from this morning is Hannah Wilt. She is, woo, that's right. Um, she is an IDS major concentrating in um, biology, psychology, and art. I'm really excited to hear from them this morning. Um, so I'm going to keep it short so that they can have as much time as possible, but uh, if you will give a warm Scots welcome for Brad. the semester of D'Angelo, so that felt fitting. Thank you for indulging me. Okay, good morning, Covenant College. Um, I'm very excited to be here this morning. I really am so stoked, so honored um, that I could be speaking to you this morning. I'm really excited, and, uh, and what do you say? It's, it's hard, thinking about a senior testimony, um, there's no way to encapsulate four years of human experience and do a 12-minute chapel talk that's already been wasted away two minutes from silence and D'Angelo. But you can't encapsulate everything. And so I encourage you, I think the other senior testimony speakers have felt this uh, challenge that you can't fit everything, you have to be selective. Um, I encourage you to be a gracious listener um, as you're reflecting on the past testimonies as you're listening today. Uh, it's only a sliver of the past four years. You have to be selective. So I was thinking, you know, what do you say in a time like this? I could tell you... Um, about a lot of things. I could tell you about the process in the first few months of my time at Covenant, where my, my fellow catacombians were kind of brainwashing me out of, my, um, out of these habits I'd developed, these terrible, godless, liberal, and nudist habits I developed in California. Because <laughs> that's all that happens over there. I could tell you... I could tell you about all the huge novels my friends in my house are reading, all the three-hour-long movies in foreign languages, the postmodern play that they're writing right now. I could tell you about that. Um, I could talk to you about, uh, as quarterback, um, <laughs> the, the time that the varsity football team that we climbed out of a 21-3 deficit in order to win the conference championship for the first time since 1978. I could tell you. But I'll spare you. And there were two things I could not shake as I was thinking about what to say, how to, how to boil it down. Um, and so let's dive right in as to not waste any more time. I have two points and two Wendell Berry quotes to go along with those points. So I'm going to dive right in. In his book, Hannah Coulter, from the main character's perspective, Hannah, he says, most people now are looking for a better place, which means that a lot of them will end up in a worse one. There is no better place, not in this world. And it is by the place we've got and our love for it and our keeping of it that this world is joined to heaven. So the first point I have this is a, uh, a way that I've received from Covenant, a way I've been transformed, and I think I'm better for it, I'm definitely thankful for it, um, is this community's taught me about place. I don't think I had a theology of place as I came here. Um, I grew up in the Christian church. I think there was solid theology where I grew up, the churches that I was at, but I didn't really have a concept of how to treat the things of earth. And since we've been here, I've heard 
a lot of discourse on what to do with the things of earth. What does it mean that we're here? Is it just punching a ticket to heaven, or is it more than that? How do we handle earthly pleasures, earthly pains? Um, I'm not here to talk about buzzword embodiment, but what does it mean that we're embodied? Um, And connected to that, that's kind of where I started to grow in this concept of place. Um, We are here right now, like bodily, which means we are bound to a spatial location. I can only shout so far, I can only walk so far in an hour, I can only see so many miles away from here, even though modern technology is really fancy. And don't get me wrong, I love FaceTime. I'm really glad my mom's on the live stream. What's up? We are bound by our bodies to this place, and therefore, we are bound to a people. God has limited us in such a way that we would be forced into relationship with others. And I've learned to consider those things. It's, it's impacted me greatly. Think, um, think about the tendencies that we face in our modern culture to focus inward, to not invest in the place or the people that you dwell in right now, or to focus on the big issues. We're in college, we learn about faraway things, old things, and it'd be so easy to miss the fact that we live within like four square feet of 20 to 30 other people, and that's on purpose, and that's what I've what I've learned here, something I'm so thankful for, is that God's taught me I'm not in the physical place I'm in on accident. It's not meaningless. God means something for it. And what that means is that we would dive into right relationship with one another, that we would suffer with one another, that we would share joy with one another. But it's all about proximity. It's all what's right around us. And we don't need to look much further So what would it look like to do that here? You can wish to be in another place with other people, but you won't partake in the joy that comes from suffering and loving those right next to you. You can strive to change the world and focus on big issues, but you won't have nearly the impact that you would if you focused your energy on those within your proximity. Our greatest power lies in our proximity. Our greatest influence is in the people that are right next to us. And I don't want us to overlook that. And that's something I've delighted so much in and soaked in so much since I've been here at Covenant. I'm thankful for that. Now my second point that I want to spend the rest of the time in, to start with another Wendell Berry quote. This one's a poem, a very short poem called Why. It says, why all the embarrassment about being happy? Sometimes I'm as happy as a sleeping dog. And for the same reasons and for others. And so, I want to ask you, Covenant College, where's the joy? Where is your joy, Covenant? I know this place isn't void of joy. I'm not trying to make it a one-dimensional community like that, like we're all just slumping around. But I've heard it said that Covenant maybe is a place, a home for fake happy people, Uh, people who are ignoring suffering, people who have a smile on their face even when they're heartbroken inside. I've experienced something quite different, I think, It's actually really hard to experience true joy here, more specifically to express that joy uh, without it being framed in a couple of ways. One way is that the joyful person, the expressively joyful person, is naive. They're escapist. They're ignoring the suffering of the world, or they haven't really undergone much suffering, but they're turning their backs to it. And so they can be happy, but not me, because they don't know the pain I've felt. Or, second, it's personality-based. Some people, Brad, you're talking about personality. Some people are just bubblier than others, just a little more cheerful, skipping the step. Could be, but I don't think so as Christians. I think that because of our position under God, that we're his children, that we have cause for joy, and we are called to joy. And so I'd like to spend this last portion of time with this charge, a challenge to you, Covenant, something I see lacking that maybe God wants to awaken us to, to be unspeakably joyful because Jesus Christ is alive. And if you are already joyful, already happy, which I'm going to interchange those words today, by the way. It's another conversation, but joyful and happy, I'm saying the same thing. If you're already joyful, I want you to feel 
relief that you don't have to hide it or be embarrassed, that you can live under God in expressive joy. And if you are struggling for joy today, I want you to receive afresh the good news that we have that causes great joy. So two reasons today why I think we should be happy under God. One, it's a command. God commands it. It's not an option. In Philippians 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. I don't know another command in Scripture that's restated like that, just like right off the bat. Like, don't commit murder. I'll say it again. Don't commit murder. (laughs) No, but this one, being happy, that's not serious, God. Why are you? No, no, no. God repeated it. Rejoice in the Lord always. When? Always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Do it. Paul is intent on this. This isn't an option. It's not a cherry on top of the Christian life. It's a command. Why does this matter? Why does that do anything for us? Well, I think sometimes all we need to change our posture towards something is to have somebody in authority over us just tell us it's okay. So I think there's been a lot of incredible discourse at Covenant since I've been here on suffering, on real earthly pain that maybe we've ignored before, and that's so necessary and right. But I don't want us to be fooled into thinking that in order to prove to God that we're serious about suffering, that we're serious about our holiness, that we have to be somber, that we can't partake in joy, that we have purity of emotion where we can only experience suffering or only joy. There's more than that going on. It's a command. God gives us permission. Did you hear that? God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be happy all the time. He's saying, I want you to think about me all the time and for that to cause great joy. You can celebrate me always. Do you hear that? Do you know that the one who sustains you, loves you, has saved you forever and wants you to live under his provision in joy? And second, why be joyful? Jesus is alive. Even if there weren't an explicit statement in Scripture telling me to be joyful, I would. Why? Because that's the natural response when a dude flings back up from the grave. (laughs) Are you hearing this? Jesus was dead once, and now he's not. It's not a normal Monday. Come on. Like, this isn't like, oh, like... There's just like a lot of tests this week. I'm like, my friends are being really mean, and I don't know if Caesar likes me. (laughs) Jesus is back from the dead. This isn't a normal Monday. You know the guy. that's, That's no cause for slumping around. That should change our step a little bit, change the way that we walk. And I think that's exactly the effect it should have. God took away our biggest problem. And that doesn't mean we don't have other smaller problems. But it does mean they don't really get to us in the same way. The final sting's been taken away. We know the end. He's promised us glory with him. We have a home with him. So what happens now can still hurt a little bit, but it's just not the same. We walk a little differently. Our joy is indestructible. It can't be taken away because Jesus will never die again. He's alive forever. When Jesus appears to John in Revelation 1, it's a beautiful scene, and he says, Be not afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Again, you see that? Jesus is standing here, dangling the keys of Hades in his fingers, and you know the guy. That changes everything. This isn't a normal Monday. This is the reason we can always rejoice Now let me finish with this, maybe a a, a final push uh, with an evangelistic tilt to it. We believe some kind of crazy things, y'all. Virgin birth, resurrection from the dead, trinity we can't really explain too well. True things, weird for our modern world. But maybe weirder than all is the thought that we're born evil and we should disobey our nature. Our nature's bad, we have to turn from it and turn to God and have him change our nature. Strange, right? We want to think that we're born right. What reason does the world have to hear our message if we are not offering a life of superior joy? When we're telling them, disobey your nature and turn to God and have him form you, and then we're just slumping around because it's Monday. 
Why should they listen? We have to be joyful because Jesus truly is alive, and that is our hope. That is our joy. We have to be joyful, or who's going to hear our message? Finally, Paul, when he's telling the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, what, what, what do we do to commend our ministry, our message to others? How do we offer this good news to people? Through all these paradoxes, he says, through honor and dishonor. We're known yet, we're unknown yet completely known by God. We're poor yet making many rich. And then he gets to this one. We're sorrowful yet always rejoicing. It's not one or the other. We can experience true sorrow and yet always have reason to be joyful. Because Jesus Christ was dead, now he's alive. And he's not going to die again. And he's going to carry us through death with him. And we will dwell with him. That is our hope. I'm afraid we spend too much time viewing our everyday lives in separation from the resurrection of Jesus, and it's not separate at all. Jesus is breathing somewhere right now. His heart is beating somewhere right now, and that changes the way you do and think about and say everything. That's what I want us to hear, Covenant. I want you to be a happy place. I want you to dwell on the resurrection of Jesus before your feet hit the ground in the morning. And I want that to change the way that you walk. Let's do that together in this place that we're bound to. Let's point each other to the Christ that is still alive. Would you pray with me? Father, you are not gone. Jesus is not away from us right now. He said he'll be with us. When? Always. How long? Until the end. So Lord, let that change us. Let your presence with us day in, day out fill us with joy. Give us reason to be glad always, even in the midst of sorrow. Thank you for that possibility, God. We love you. Amen. Thank you. Now, if you would, please... Give another round of applause, a welcome to our second speaker, Hannah Wilt. Boy. <laughs> hey guys. Um, I'm just going to jump right in because we're a little short on time, but yeah. Okay. Okay. I hope I joined. The way I would describe my relationship with God is as a series of immense softenings within myself, ones that entailed a giving up of my control and an acknowledgement that I don't always have to be strong and put together. These time periods in my life have been extremely painful, disarming, and destabilizing. But in the process, they have revealed to me a sense of peace in the midst of a storm and have taught me to be able to let go of the delusional concept of complete control and the belief that we are the masters of our own fate. I will not stand in front of you all and say that this has been easy, that I have not at times clawed at what I want to keep within my grasp as it has been ripped away from me. But what I will say is that despite how heartbreaking much of this experience has been, it has allowed me to come to one of the most important understandings I could ever ask for, that no matter what I do, God will not abandon me, and that I am not alone because he is walking right beside me through it all. On September 1st, 2017, I was diagnosed with abdominal peritoneal mesothelioma. I had woken up one morning that July with such bad pain in my lower right abdomen that I couldn't even walk normal. This began about a two-month process of hospital visits to an eventual surgery on August 25th to remove ovarian cysts. To me, everything had gone smoothly, and I was going to return back to school shortly to finish my senior year of college. Never could I have anticipated the conversation I was going to have only five days later. I was walking downstairs, and when I saw everyone in my family sitting in the living room, my mom said to me, I need to talk to you. They found something during surgery. I felt my heart drop through the floor, and I immediately knew what that meant. I had cancer. I began sobbing, as did the rest of my family, which only led to my sister nervously blurting out, Mom said you can get a dog, which stopped the tears for just a few seconds. Um, 
But I can remember thinking, Lord, I can't do this. Please don't make me do this. And how scared of I was of what lay ahead of me. For the next two weeks, my stomach would drop constantly throughout the day as the reality of my situation would hit me again and again and again. The sadness I felt was all-consuming. The initial stages of something like cancer are really confusing. There's the process of letting people know and dealing with their weird responses, which often can be pretty insensitive and confusing. Then there are the doctor's appointments across the country, where each time you get to re-experience what it feels like to be diagnosed with cancer. The doctors will confirm the diagnosis, you'll sit there as they tell you your statistics, then they'll go through their prognosis, which consists of a terrifying explanation of the chemo and surgery they have planned, and the different possibilities of what organs will ha have to be removed, as well as what life could potentially look like after cancer treatment. In my case, the doctors wanted to hit me quick, and they wanted to hit me hard. That meant they wanted to do extensive chemo before and after surgery, with a surgery that would consist of the most invasive cut you can get, removal of multiple organs, including my female organs, and the potential to never fully recover back to your previous potential. Oh, and there's still the possibility that your cancer will come back. Decisions that I was forced to make during this time are ones that I hope you never, that none of you ever have to experience, and it truthfully was a long process for me to be able to go through what needed to be done. Between the time of September to February, my condition severely declined. I was sleeping constantly, had fevers almost every night, and my stomach was becoming more and more distended. What we had been doing was not working, so it was time to reevaluate and come up with a new plan. We had tried multiple routes and everything we could do to not have to go through the worst possibility, but in the end, it was unavoidable. To have struggled with my faith the way I did during this time, I believe is only natural, though uncomfortable and something we don't always like to talk about or acknowledge. Initially, there was fear, which then turned into anger. I was so angry with God that he would let something like this happen to me. I had upended everything in my life, started completely from scratch in obedience to him, moved across the country away from everything that was comfortable to start my life over here at Covenant and worked so hard to become a better, healthier version of myself. And honestly, I was doing a pretty good job. I understood that to follow Christ requires giving up what you think your life should look like and allowing God to shape it to what he knows is best for you and that this process is an extremely uncomfortable thing. To follow Christ is to give up, is a giving up of our control. And I had been working hard to do just that, to say, not my will, Lord, but yours. So why then had he allowed me to have cancer? At first, I believed that I was holding onto my youth and health too tightly and that God was trying to teach me to let go of something that I cared about too much. I've heard this kind of thing from a lot of people where they think God is punishing them for loving something too much, so he takes it away, whether it be a job, a friendship, a significant other, um, and so on. To any of you that have felt this way before, I want you to hear me when I say this. God is not that insecure. Yes, God is a jealous God, and he's jealous for your love, but that doesn't mean he destroys anything that gets in the way of you and him. He wants you to choose to love him more than any of these other things. Otherwise, he won't have given us free will. Because what is love if it's not a decision that you made? What I think is actually happening in these situations where we think God is punishing us is that suffering and pain exposes our weaknesses, and our weaknesses expose the things we care about the most. So in the case of losing a friend, maybe it's just that you rely too much on the affirmation of your relationships to believe that you are worthy of love, rather than knowing that God loves you no matter what you do. In my case... I was scared to let go of the control of my own body and my life because I have felt like all my life, nothing has ever been stable or safe. I was afraid to put everything on the line and trust God because I wasn't so sure if this God could be trusted. In that fear of giving up myself, I struggled to find purpose in it all. Such a battle for my life felt meaningless, like there was nothing to be fighting for. I felt like a part of myself had already died and I was terrified that God was asking too much of me. I looked at myself and I thought, what could possibly be worth so much loss and suffering? I did not feel like I had the strength or faith to trust God with my life, to believe that he would take care of me and that he could, had good things for my life. Therefore, there was no purpose for me to keep struggling through it all. I'd gone from a strong, healthy 22-year-old, about to be a senior in college, a captain on the track team, graduate with my friends, and so on, to now living back home and isolated from my community, being exhausted just by walking up the steps 
and afraid that any mistake I made would only make my cancer worse. I felt like everything had gone backwards, that none of my hard work had been worth it, and I was so mad that God had let this happen. But it was also during this time that I learned the importance of the church and the community around you. I learned how it's okay to not see the purpose in your suffering and to be mad at God, because God can handle your anger. It's okay to not believe or pray sometimes, because that's where the church steps in to pray and believe for you. And my church at home did just that. I was blessed enough to have an entire body of believers love me and believe enough for me that God would take care of me, that slowly but surely, I was eventually able to see that for myself, though this process was slow. I'm so thankful, too, for the people I know I had praying for me here at Covenant and especially Dr. Kapek, who consistently emailed me throughout the whole year to tell me he was praying for me, who didn't try to make sense of my suffering, but instead helped me to not feel alone, and always answered my long and often very, very emotional emails. I am thankful to all the staff and teachers here who are still willing to walk through this process with me, as anyone who has dealt with cancer before knows. It's something that is a part of your life forever. It was also during this time that I learned what it meant to be thankful and present in the day you are in. If I was able to work out a little one day, then I did so. If I sat on the couch all day playing Zelda on my Nintendo Switch, then I was content with the option to be able to be distracted from my situation that day. I learned to let myself be angry, to be sad, to be joyful, to let every day just be whatever it needed to look like. I learned to be thankful that I had a home to live in, that I had a mother and a family to come home to, a mother that walked through it with me every single step of the way. I gave my mom a mother, Mother's Day card last year that said, without you I'd literally be dead. <laughs> it's obviously a joke on how your mother gave birth to you, but for me, it was in the literal sense of how my mom took care of me for the whole entire time I was sick. Having cancer and being so sick, you need to have someone in your corner to fight for you because honestly, sometimes you can't fully acknowledge the reality of your situation. I am blessed enough that I had a mother who fought tooth and nail for me. Thank you, Mom. God's presence in the last month or so before my surgery was undeniable, and at last, I began to be able to stop fighting him. One night while driving by the beach back home, after the gym in the stillness of the night and being alone, I became so overwhelmingly aware of God's closeness to me like a wave that rushed over me, and I felt him say, we go until we can go no more. I pulled over in front of the ocean, and I wept for what I was going to have to do. And I wept in the understanding that God was going to be there with me every step of the way. At last, I gave it all up, and I said, okay, I can do this. I wept because I finally understood what it meant to not be alone. My surgery in total took nine hours, in which my spleen my uterus, an ovary, my appendix, part of my large intestines, and my greater omentum were removed, which was then followed by a high pec treatment in which they completely saturate your abdominal cavity for 90 minutes with heated chemotherapy. I remember waking up finally, and there were wires and tubes coming out from everywhere. A few days in, I got into an argument with a nurse when I threatened to pull out the NG tube. This is the tube that goes from your nose to your stomach, because um, it kept making me cough which is super fun when your stomach muscles have just been cut in half. That time in the hospital, and even following when I got home, I didn't know it was possible to experience such pain. I couldn't do anything myself, as the simplest task exhausted me, and my body had just been completely traumatized. I slept in my mom's room for two months, and it was three months before I could sleep on my side again without it feeling like my rib cage was getting crushed. I was constantly exhausted, had to relearn how to eat and digest my food, and was a whopping 118 pounds. I can remember looking in the mirror and crying because I didn't recognize the girl looking back at me. The now 23-year-old girl who had worked so hard was no longer there in my eyes, and I felt as though I had completely lost myself. Literally, everything had been stripped away, and all that I was left with was my existence. This, for me, was a revelatory thing. How do I still find myself worthy of love and necessary enough to exist if I can no longer be the Hannah I have always been? Where do I find my sense of self 
when it feels like all that I am has been ripped away, leaving just a shell of a girl that barely exists in the space that she occupies, especially when that existence is so painful. This process of refining myself has taken an extremely long time, but I think I was able to do it in a way that first began with the understanding that I am worthy because I am God's, and not because of any sort of expectations that someone or myself put on me. My time having to not only look death in the eyes, but also embrace that possibility, gave me a profound understanding of the lack of control of something that is taken for granted by all of us on a daily basis, that at any point in time, this could be our last breath. I am able to go forward because I can take it a day at a time, and because I know that ultimately, I am not the one that's in control. So if your very life be put into the hands of God in such an in-your-face way, you can't help but be changed by it. When I had my first scan, July 2018, to see if they had gotten all the disease, there was a moment a few days before where I thought to myself, even if I'm just buying time, it has all been worth it. That is the peace that I can experience when I am able to give up my life to God and know that he is taking care of me. In the beginning of Job, we see Job lamenting his birth and questioning the point of his existence. He states in chapter 6, What is my strength that I should wait, and what is my end that I should be patient? Then later in 7, he says, I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are a breath. I was reading through it the other day, and honestly, I started laughing. But not because it's funny. <laughs> but because I have felt this exact way. This feeling of questioning an existential crisis is so rampant and important that it's important enough to address that it's right here in scripture. I'm, com I'm comforted by the honesty in which Job struggles, and as we know, Job is no stranger to suffering. In Kurt Vonnegut's book, Slaughterhouse-Five, the main character, Billy, Gr Billy Pilgrim, is in the veteran's hospital healing from war injuries after being a prisoner. Every time his mother comes to visit Billy, he hides beneath his bedsheets, and he won't talk or look at her. His mother keeps on trying to get him to respond, but to no avail, and so she leaves. The story goes on to tell us that it wasn't because Billy resented his mother that he ignored her, but it was because he, she was the one who gave him life, and he was ashamed because often he doesn't feel grateful to be alive. This shame, I think, is something we often don't talk about in the Christian community, and it is one that I have struggled with, and I still do. I'll feel like I'm ungrateful or like I'm selfish because of how hard life can be at times, that I'm not sure how much more grief I can carry around with me. But then you read through scripture and all of a sudden you're confronted with all this pain and suffering and questioning. And the answer we're met with is a God that saves us by dying for us. I don't think we can begin to comprehend God's love and grace until we allow ourselves to confront the difficult questions like pain and suffering. If we constantly keep pulling our bed sheets over our head, we are cutting ourselves off from the opportunity to experience God showing up in the ways he promises to, rather than just vapidly stating a scripture, because that's what Sunday school taught us. We are able to step into the truth of it all and say, that is true, and my life is a reflection of that. We are able to see that thankfulness and joy doesn't look like always being happy and saying thank you all the time, but rather, it looks like reverence for a God that calls us child sacrifices his son so that we can be with him, and gives us his spirit so that he may dwell in us. We can't heal until we are first honest with ourselves and with God, because I hate to break it to you, he already knows what you're thinking. And it's, it's just that when you're honest with him that he says finally, I can work with this. This past February, my father died from non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Over the span of three weeks, he was admitted to ICU and then passed away. Going home and spending a week and a half in the house, spending a week and a half in the hospital with him, literally watching my father die in front of me, I couldn't help but be brought back to my own experience and struggle with cancer. The beeping IV monitors, the sterile smell of the hospital, the way the hospital gowns snap by the shoulders. It was also familiar because less than a year ago, that was me. Life has continuously broken my heart, and at times, it has felt agonizing to look at the reality of it all that has splayed out in front of me. This time around, though, with my dad, there wasn't even an attempt to try not to feel the pain and grief of it all. I allowed myself to melt into what was aching, to cry as I saw needed, in the process, love my family around me as they grieved too. What I saw happen during these weeks and the following ones was something I can think I can say honestly I've never seen in my family before. 
My family that had once been so divided, with parents in the process of getting a divorce, was now all together holding one another as we each took our turn to mourn. What I saw in all of this was grace, in such a beautiful way that I don't even know how to put it into words. And this, I believe, is one of the paradoxical things about God. That in the most painful times of mourning, there can be this wild exchange of love and joy that simultaneously exists when we, just, when we decide to love despite how bad we are hurting. Suffering and joy are not opposites, but can both exist in the same moment in a way that I think only grace allows. And I think part of that comes when we stop trying to make sense of it all and just let the situation be what it is. When we let go of the delusion that we have it all together and we have ultimate control, we allow space for God to step in and give us the gift of peace that comes with the understanding that he is right there in the pits with us. As painful as this has all been, I've found that these moments of suffering allow us to see more clearly the profound and simple beauty that exists around us. In fact, it has allowed me to live more simply in general because it has shown me what is actually important and what matters in this life. People matter. Honesty matters. Loving one another matters. Every single one of you here matter. And there is meaning and purpose in the fact that I am still here and able to stand before all of you to tell you what the Lord has done in my life. To be able to rejoice in what the Lord has done does not mean that all that ha has happened isn't painful or that it no longer hurts. I still have nights where I cry myself to sleep. I still have panic attacks of pains that I get in my stomach, afraid that my cancer is back. Or times where my sadness feels paralyzing. There are so many days that the most I'm going to get done is feed myself and exercise and play with my dog. And I've learned that that is okay and that that is enough. I can still be thankful that I will get to see, live to see my friends get married, to become an aunt, and maybe eventually have a family, while simultaneously grieving the fact that I will never bear a child of my own. I can be both weak and strong at the same time. My relationship with God has felt like a consistent push for him to reach deeper inside me, to crack open rib by rib my pain and fear and sin. Each time I cry out in agony to him, and each time his answer is simply, I know. And he really does know, because we have a God that walked among us and died for us so that we could be with him. All he asks for in return is for us to love and trust him. For me, that looked like trusting him with my life, for my family, them and trusting him with their daughter and sister. To be close to Jesus and to love is to understand suffering, because love on this earth is a suffering love. I want to end my time with this last thought. In a show I recently watched, the main character is struggling with how to make sense of the pain and suffering that he and the people around him keep experiencing. As he talks to his friend about his confusions, she gives him this simple response. I think that life is here to make us kinder. Because you have experienced pain, you can be kinder to people in ways that others cannot. She does not give him some long and philosophical explanation as to why his suffering is good. But rather, she shows him that despite what hurts him, despite what hurts all of us, we can choose to love one another because we know what it's like to feel alone. And honestly, I think sometimes life is as simple as that. If after all of this, the result is that I can pull back those bed sheets of shame for someone else and say, yes, this is really hard, but you are not alone, then I think I'm okay with that. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for this time um, to share what you've done in my life, to be honest, um, but also to rejoice in the fact that I'm here. I thank you for Brad's testimony as well for the truth that he speaks and the way we get to laugh as we hear all that you've done. Um, I just thank you for all these people here and for Covenant College and that we even have the ability to say what you have done in our lives um, and that we are allowed a space for that. I just pray that you bless everyone here um, in these next couple weeks as we finish up. Um, and that you just show up in each one of our lives in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen.